resilience and grit is something you developed by taking on these challenging tasks, or is it something you had? I think that question is almost always a both and. I think, you know, the science is pretty clear that you get better at doing hard things by doing hard things. Um, I also found that I really enjoyed these risky, I, you know, somewhat risky anyway, but I don't think base jumping makes any sense at all. But uh, <laughs> but skydiving for most people sounds risky. And I ended up really enjoying that kind of thing. I enjoyed nearing, I enjoyed pushing myself. I think that that's the key is I, I started to realize that I enjoyed pushing myself and I enjoyed the results that came from pushing myself. And, um, and that comes from that exposure and from that experience for sure. So, so I would say it's, it's sort of a both and equation. Each time you do something challenging, you get better at doing challenging things. And, um, and if it's in mountaineering, then that applies to school. And if it's in school, that can apply to skydiving. And so all of those sorts of lessons build on each other, even if they're in different parts of your life. And it seems like you're one of those people that when you're told you can't do it, you get charged up. And I love the fact that you became one of the first women to fly the Apache attack helicopter and the story behind that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm happy to share that. It is. Um, I, I think that's probably true. I, you know, I, I, again, I was fortunate to grow up with a family that said that I could do anything I wanted to. Um, and once you get a little bit older, you realize not everybody thinks that and not everybody is as supportive as that. And um, it's good that we're sort of young and naive and willing to push through some of those things. Uh, at the same time, being young and naive can also mean that we get crippled by those things. So that's why this story is one that I like to share, especially for leaders who are facing obstacles that they didn't expect maybe or that they haven't faced in the past. And uh, yeah, and that story is, is being a college student, I was drilling with the National Guard as part of a simultaneous membership program as part of my reserve officer training course scholarship. And I was at Duke University, I was studying English Lit. I was part of the um, uh, an aviation battalion in Raleigh, North Carolina. So towards the end of my college years, I drove out to Raleigh to receive my assignment for the years ahead. There was a um, state aviation officer there. He was a colonel, so he was probably, you know, around 40 years old. I had just turned 21. I hadn't yet graduated from college, so I'm just a college student. I hadn't yet been commissioned, so I was just a cadet. I wasn't even a lieutenant. And, uh, and I remember standing in front of his desk, and it seemed like his desk was as wide as the room, right? It seemed like those plate glass windows that went up the back were shiny and, and, uh, and that I had essentially that it was a completely overwhelming sort of a place to be. And... I stood at attention and saluted and he asked me to sit down and we had this interchange and uh, a couple of sentences back and forth. And then he said this thing that I'll never forget when he stopped in the middle of a sentence and he leaned back in his chair and looked down his nose and said, you realize cadet that you will never fly an attack aircraft. And, you know, I looked back at him and it was, it was a surprising comment because attack aircraft at the time weren't open to women to fly. But I knew that the only response in that situation was to say, yes, sir. And so I said, yes, sir. And, uh, and I went back to the ROTC detachment on the campus of Duke University, and I requested a transfer out of the National Guard and onto active duty. And later that spring, Congress changed the game on that colonel and everybody else who had similar proclivities uh, and lifted the combat exclusion clause. And suddenly everything in the inventory was open to women and men to fly. That, of course, was only the beginning of the journey. But, um, but I think it was one of those places that I learned that I had to own my own story, that there would always be times that somebody else tried to put me into a narrative and uh, that if I wanted to own my own story, I was going to have to do the work to do that.